You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work after each section. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers on the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers from the question booklet to an answer sheet. You should be prepared to do this with the practices. Now turn to section one. Section one. In this section, you will hear a conversation between a visa officer and an applicant. First, you will have some time to read questions one to five. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion, only the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, visa office. How can I help you? Good morning. I'd like to apply for a visa to Australia, please. Certainly, sir. I'll just get a form, and then I'll need to take some details down. The applicant wants to apply for a visa to Australia, so the word Australia is provided in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, visa office. How can I help you? Good morning. I'd like to apply for a visa to Australia, please. Certainly, sir. I'll just get a form, and then I'll need to take some details down. Okay, here we go. Right. Can I have your name, please? Yes, it's Okamura, Kelly Okamura. And how do you spell that, please? K E double L. No, your family name, please. Oh, sorry. It's O. K A M U R A. O K A M U R A. And your address? Apartment one o six, Kingston Street, Hawaii. Kingston Street, Hawaii. Yes, that's correct. So you're an American? Actually, I was born in Japan, but moved to Hawaii six years ago. And can I have your age, please, Mr. Okamura? I'm thirty-two. And are you married? Yes, I am. My wife's Chinese. And will your wife accompany you to Australia? Yes, she will. In fact, that's the reason we want to go. Her sister lives in Sydney. Now you will have another chance to look at questions six to ten. As the conversation continues, answer questions six to ten. Do you have any relatives living in Australia? I used to have an uncle, but he died several years ago. Now there's only my sister-in-law and my wife's cousin. So the purpose of your trip is to visit your wife's relatives. Am I correct? Well, not exactly. Mainly because I have my own trading company. And I will be looking for business opportunities. Although I do want to do some travelling as well, you know, see some of the sights, that sort of thing. Although I don't intend to work in Australia. And your wife, what will she be doing? She'll be studying English. She wants a student visa. And how long do you plan to stay? About one year, I guess. Well, I'm afraid a standard tourist visa is only valid for thirty days. Although in your case, we can issue you with a business visa. Business visas last for six months, but you will be able to renew it. We can give your wife a twelve-month visa, though. Six months is okay. 
So what do I need to do now? Come along to the office any time during weekdays, but it must be office hours. We close at five thirty. And bring along two passport-sized photos and your passport, of course. Your wife will also need two photos, so that's four passport-sized photos in total. Okay. Thank you for your help. Bye. Bye. That is the end of section one. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear an informative talk given by Michael on how to keep out burglars and keep your home safe. Before you listen, you have a chance to read questions eleven to twenty. Listen to the first part of the talk carefully, and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Keep them out. There's no fail-proof way to keep out a burglar, but every little bit of deterrence helps. Even if you can't afford a security system, you can take a few minutes to make your home a little safer. Some relatively simple steps. Will greatly decrease the odds of a break-in, which means you can enjoy more peace of mind. And isn't that what home is all about? Think like a burglar. If you were one, how would you get into your home? Evaluate your home from the inside and out, day and night. You might even try a mock break-in, trying window jams and locks on the house's perimeter. To keep out a burglar. The first thing to do is to secure the windows. Though windows are relatively easy to break, the loud noise of shattering glass will deter a thief if you're near other houses. Don't leave your windows open during the night, whether you're at home or away. That's a common sense precaution, but a surprising number of people forget to do just that. Use a pick-proof locking device for your windows. Make sure the frames are solid. If you're beyond the earshot of your neighbours, they won't hear the glass breaking. Consider installing a plexiglass sheet for the more accessible windows. This will make entry through them more difficult. Your doors should also be secured. If you don't have a peephole, install one in the front door. If you have one, make sure that you and your family are in the habit of using it. Don't open the door to anyone you don't know, especially at night. If the peephole is out of the reach of your children, keep a step ladder or stepping box by the door for them to use. If there's any glass within two feet of your front door lock, consider a locking device that would be out of reach if that glass is broken. Now, a few tips on how to protect your valuables. Don't leave your valuables, stereo, computer. Jewelry, etc., where they can be seen from the window. If you don't want to hide everything from sight, consider blinds. Make a valuables inventory. Keep a record of your expensive and personally significant items, not just a listing, but a photographic or videotape record, if possible. Store this inventory at another location. This is helpful for both the police and the insurance agency. To identify the stolen goods, 
Use an engraving pen to mark these items with some kind of personal identifying information, such as your initials, in an inconspicuous place. This also helps record your possessions in case of any other mishap, such as fire or flood. Now, you will have another chance to look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. Don't stop your security awareness at the outside walls of your house. Your yard areas, if any, also deserve your attention. In general, don't leave anything around the yard that might help a burglar get into your house. Ladders, stackable boxes, or any garden tools should be put away preferably in a locked cabinet. Install a light in your yard that is sensitive to movement. Place it high and out of reach. Trim hedges or bushes that are near doors or windows. These can be good hiding places. Don't place outdoor furniture tables nearby the house. These could become an easy stepladder to the roof. When you are on vacation, Create the occupancy illusion. Maybe you laughed at your mother for leaving the lights on and the radio playing while she left for vacation, but she had the right idea. Those steps aren't quite enough, so try these strategies. Buy electronic timers that turn lights on and off at different times. Hook up a timer to your TV for a few hours each evening. Turn the volumes up too. Not enough to annoy the neighbours, just enough that a lurker at the windowsill couldn't miss hearing it. Have your newspaper and mail delivery suspended. If you don't have time to do this, ask a neighbour to pick them up for you. Ask a neighbour to park in your driveway or parking place. Think about having someone house-sit your home. If he's a relative or friend, he may cost you no more than the contents of your refrigerator. You can also find professional house-sitters or house-sitting services that find someone to stay while you're away. Leave your shades as they are normally, or at least don't close up every one. One sign of a vacant house is closed shades during the day. Lock your garage door with a padlock. That is the end of section two. You will have Half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. In this section, you are going to hear a conversation between Anne and Merton. In the first part of the conversation, they are talking about the commands of training dogs. First look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, that research paper we have to do next is the one about different styles of training dogs. How do you think you'll approach writing it? You know, I've been thinking about it and I feel that the best way to write it is to divide the paper into two main parts. In the first part, would be analysing some examples of each style of training dogs. Right. First, what the styles are. 
After that, we can talk about how each style can be used so that the dogs learn something different from each one. Indeed. Maybe we could draw a chart and compare examples of each style of training, one at a time. So, the different kinds of training would be simple obedience training. There you would have things like teaching them to sit or stay in one place and so on. Right. So included here would be simple audio commands, like speak. Yes, basic commands are just spoken words, aren't they? And then there would be the more guard-oriented training, where the dogs are trained to know a specific place well. Patrolling and barking are probably the best examples, because most people have seen them in many places, especially in homes. And this would lead us to the attack dog training, which is physical as well as spoken. Training the dog to knock someone down, and even bite if they have to. Right. So there's another category as well. Sniffing dogs, which make up the searching category. I've read that in the UK, every major airport or government building has these dogs to search for all kinds of dangerous items. In the second part of the conversation, Anne and Merton talk about all kinds of training and what kind of dog they are suitable for. You will have another chance to look at questions 26 to 30. Listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. I can believe that. Well, we have a good list to build on. We're finally getting started now, so let's try to figure out when each type of dog training should be used. I guess we can start by trying to figure out the best situation for each type of dog training. Hmm, what do you mean? What I mean is whether each type of training should be used with different kinds of dogs. We could use basic obedience training, for example, and ask whether it's more useful for a small dog, a medium-sized dog, and so on. In this case, I'd say obedience training is best with small dogs because they tend to get excited easily and this will help keep them out of trouble. OK, that makes sense. Then, let's look at physical training. Even though some people think it's ideal for every breed of dog, I think it's better suited to the larger kinds. Small dogs usually just aren't smart enough to understand the physical commands, and they can even get hurt from them. The specialised sniffing training is the same. I think it's better with the more intelligent breeds of dogs, and it's hardly ever useful with really small dogs. Attack training, however, can be useful for every kind of large dog, as long as the dog is treated well and given a lot of attention and care. All right. And what about guard training? Barking is an ideal way for small dogs to guard a home. I know they aren't big enough to stop a person, but making some noise is often all a dog needs to do. Other kinds of guard training, like biting, though, are different. I'd always plan to teach that to a smart dog, giving them a chance to use their brains and defend their homes. I'd have to agree. Trainers often just teach large dogs to bark at a person when they think something isn't right. But if the dogs know how to use physical skills in a bad situation, they could save their owner's life someday. Yes. I suppose that different people would have different needs for their pets. Right. And different trainers would recommend different methods for different breeds. That is the end of Section 3. You will now have... Half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. In this section, you will hear a lecture given by Dr. Jesperson about children's language acquisition. As you listen to the talk, answer questions 31 to 40. First, you will have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today, in our series of lectures on human language, we are going to be looking at the way in which children acquire language. The study of how people learn to speak has proved to be one of the most fascinating, important and complex branches of language study. So let's look at these three features in turn. Firstly, why is it fascinating? This stems from the natural interest people take in the developing abilities of young children. People are fascinated by the way in which children learn, particularly their own children. Secondly, it is important to study how we acquire our first language, because the study of child language can lead us to a greater understanding of language as a whole. The third point is that it's a complex study and this is because of the enormous difficulties that are encountered by researchers as soon as they attempt to explain language development, especially in the very young child. In today's lecture, we will cover a number of topics. We will start by talking about research methods. There are a number of ways that researchers have investigated children's language, and these include the use of diaries, recordings and tests and we'll be looking at how researchers make use of these various methods. We will then go on to examine the language learning process, starting with the development of speech in young infants during the first year of life. This is the time associated with the emergence of the skills of speech perception, in other words, an emergence of the child's awareness of his or her own ability to speak. We will continue with our examination of the language learning process, this time by looking at language learning in the older child, that is, in children under five. As they mature, it is possible to begin analysis in conventional linguistic terms, and so, in our analysis, we will look at phonological, grammatical and semantic development in preschool children. In the second part of the talk, I would like to review some educational approaches to the question of how linguistic skills can be developed. In other words, how can we assist the young child to learn language skills at school? Initially, we will look at issues that arise in relation to spoken language. We will then look at reading and review a number of approaches that have been proposed in relation to the teaching of reading. Finally, we will conclude today's talk with an account of current thinking about the most neglected area of all, the child's developing awareness of written language. That is the end of section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of Listening Practice Test 5. At the end of the real test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the Listening Answer Sheet.